what Hubert Harrison, who I'm, whose biography I'm completing the second volume on now, that early 20th century activist, he wrote way back in uh, 1912, 100 years ago. He, he goes, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. And a touchstone is an extraordinary metaphor because a touchstone is a black stone. You rub it against gold to see if, if the metal is really what it's supposed to be. And any issue we look at in society, I think we want to approach from that perspective. We want to look. In the workplace, we'd look at discipline. Two workers, same offense. Black worker might get twice the, the they get a two-week suspension. White worker gets a one-week, right? Um, the the uh, light-duty work for pregnant women. The black women treated much more harshly than the, the European-American women, right? Every issue we looked at, health, you know, work conditions in the workplace, it's not hard to find. I mean, we fight, you know, on behalf of working people on all these issues, but you have to be aware that there's this other element shaping it, and you have to, as a, a central part of your work, go after it. And what happened when we were working in the post office, this was new to a lot of people, like some people are talking this, and there was a lot of eyes and, you know, are people really, is this for real? You know, how long is this going to last? Because sometimes when you came to questions like overtime, workers oftentimes, you know, really live for that extra money they get from their overtime. They're two hours here, they're two hours there. But we had a pattern where it was clearly white supremacist distribution of overtime. And we challenged that. And people were ready to come to blows at first, right? But and people will look at it, is this, how long is, again, how long is this going to last? But when we do that, and when you do it consistently, uh, when I worked in the bulk mail center, payday was every other Thursday. So we made sure our bulletins came out on Thursdays because we knew that most people would be there to read it, right? At least every other Thursday. And, um, but we were steady. It wasn't we waited for incidents and then we got to jump you know, through the roof about, oh, look what happened here or there. We were steady, you know, making it part of everybody's life. So it's wonderful work. I think the work, I, it pushed, we led the statewide anti, we helped coordinate the statewide anti-apartheid struggles. In Jersey City, which is racially polarized, like parts of New York, parts of Brooklyn people may be familiar with and things like this, Jersey City, Bayonne, there's a lot of racial polarization. At, at one point, we had 3,000 out of 4,000 workers in this facility wearing anti-apartheid buttons. It was staggering. You know, it is possible. So I think it's possible to do this. I think this is the key to moving forward because I think the analysis that Harrison hints at, that Alan describes in more detail about white supremacism, racism, however it's being called, being the major retardant to class consciousness in this country is true. It's We've got to deal with it, and we're not getting any place unless we deal with it, any place significant, and I think it can be done. So I'm very optimistic, and I base it on practical experience. Now, one other thing uh, I want to use, an, uh, just to enlighten uh, listeners, another example of how the ruling class turns to white supremacy in response to labor struggle. Uh, I was in the Postal Service. I, I was involved in the 1978 strike. This is parenthetical to the main point, but I'll just point out in 78, a couple of years, two and a half years before PACO, we had a few hundred people get fired for striking against the Postal Service. That was under the Democrat Jimmy Carter. So it's not, everybody talks about uh, Reagan and the attack on PACO, but you get it from the Democrats sometimes too, right? And, more than sometimes. And, um, but uh, the point is, the big strike was 1970, and the big st postal strike of 1970 was keyed in the inner cities of Chicago and New York. And it was particularly, Chicago had a very high percentage black and Latin workers in their workforce, as did New York, very high. And um, back then, Wall Street ran on paper. Business Week did a 28-page special. You know, what's going on here? Because they couldn't get their paper to run. And Nixon's the president, and he's catching hell, right? Nixon is catching hell. So the ruling elite has got to do something about this. To make the story a little short, what their response was, there are several aspects of it. One is um, the uh, Nixon sets up a... Uh, Postal Board of Governors to act as a buffer between, because it was, he was directly had an answerable at that time. So now he has somebody he can blame, the Board of Governors, right? That's one thing he does. A uh, second thing they do is they recognize certain unions for, as a matter of fact, to make it more complicated for organizing. Uh, the one union they don't recognize, the one group that wants representation rights, is the National Alliance of Postal and Federal Employees, which is a 95, 99 percent black organization that had started in 1913 when Woodrow Wilson became president in uh, uh, segregated federal workplaces, a number of federal workplaces, and a lot of other things, and they'd been around. So they didn't recognize them, but they recognized the rural letter carriers, the letter carriers, the American postal workers, and the mail handlers, which was the union I was. But the mail handlers was taken over by LIUNA, 
which is a mob-controlled union. This is labor. Is the shirt I have on? I brought that for a purpose. Um, and labor is in 1986. Government did a big report. One of the four big mob-controlled unions in the country, right? So it's like willingly let organized crime come into your postal workforce too. And it, this particular had much to do with the mail handler health benefit plan, which is second biggest in the federal sector. There's all kinds of entangling interest. But here's the third, another thing that they did besides everything I've described, and this is crucial. The Postal Service, and there's a lot of this in the congressional record, they turned to a new system for, for working the mails, a hubs and spokes system similar to what the airlines run. They built 21 bulk mail centers. So I work in the bulk mail center. It was originally called New York International Bulk Mail Center. It's 10 miles from Harlem, 12 miles from Bed-Stuy, 12 miles from Newark, all these centers of black population. But it's in Jersey City where the public transportation is horrible. And they go from the New York City postal workforce makeup of 65%, 60% black and Latin, to 15% in Jersey City. Every bulk mail center in the country, they build 21 bulk mail centers. They're all named for big cities, but they're outside. The one for Chicago is in Cicero or Cairo, one of these places where the Klan marched, right? And it's a, it's a conscious turn to a whiter workforce. This is in the early 1970s, but you read in the congressional records, why did they do it? And you see these, it's code words sometimes. Ah, oh, we gotta go back to those workers we used to have, you know, and things like that. But again, it's part, I think, consistent part of the, not that it can't be struggled against, because we did, we, we were some very good struggle against it. But so that's from my own personal experience, one place. But overall, in answer to your question, I think for the labor movement, for working people, you know, for people from below in society, we want to wage that struggle, class it, you know, class interest clear. We want, want on behalf of poor and working people, but we have to understand that white supremacy is central to how the ruling class maintains control. It's key to what they're going to use to try and divide us. We have to struggle against it daily, and we have to know another key point Alan makes is how in the key periods, that's what they really turn to. So we have to be ready as we start having these overtures coming together. That's what they're going to come at us with and try and break us. So. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm retired. I live in North Jersey. I uh, was born in the Bronx, and I lived in this area most of my life, but I did travel quite a bit. Great. So you're nearby. Yeah. You were one that communicated with Jen. I'm sure if I have permission, I would like to probably talk to you once we start writing this script. Sure. And, uh, some I, got, I got about 800 archival, but I got lots of primary documents. We can even back some of this up. <laughs> All right, well, we have to bring it sure. to the end, but thank you so much. All right.